Welcome to the congregation of Yahweh. We're here on uh, Yahweh's Sabbath day. Greetings to those on the internet. We hope you enjoy the messages that go out. Uh, today's message is entitled, The Knowledge of Ignorance. And uh, all throughout the scriptures, uh, we see a, a, a group that are willingly ignorant. And we also see, see Yahweh's dealing with people uh, who sin in ignorance. And I want to touch on a few uh, scriptures today. And, and what kind of led me to discuss this is uh, there's a huge gap between uh, uh, religious circles, denominations, divisions in understanding. And there's a lot of people that, that believe that they're sincerely doing the will of Yahweh and uh, there's a lot of division going on, and uh, I kind of want to bring it all together with, you know, I, I pray that uh, Yeshua's sacrifice can even cover the sins of ignorance. And we're going to take a look at uh, a few scriptures. And, you know, sometimes we get a little legalistic on our understanding. Um, there are, are people that will say well if it's if you don't do it this way then then you're not in there and you know some people go to the extent that oh well you're going to burn for that uh, if you don't you know see it this way or we get into battles about words and genealogies and it's just an endless debate uh, but I, I believe that we serve a righteous creator that doesn't judge on the outward appearance but he judges according to the heart and we see in his dealings with Israel that the sins of ignorance is what was taken to the priest and there were some sins that carried the death penalty uh, but I want to touch on a few things but I'm gonna start off in Jeremiah 31 <clears throat> In Jeremiah 31, he talks about the difference between Old Covenant and New Covenant. Now, some prefer Renewed Covenant. Um, but the Messianic Scriptures talks about two covenants. And uh, Paul touches on in Galatians the allegory of the two covenants between Hagar and Sarah. But I want to start in uh, Jeremiah 31, verse 31. Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith Yahweh. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith Yahweh, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their Elohim and they shall be my people and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying no Yahweh for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them saith Yahweh for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more now some interpret this as when we have finally realized come into the when, when we've all come into this new covenant uh, then we don't have to teach anymore and everybody will know and you could also look at it as if you are in the new covenant you will know and I, I kind of see it as the latter if you're truly in his new covenant you don't have to be taught because you already know him. And the evidence of knowing him is he's put his Torah in your inward parts. He's written it in your hearts. You have a desire. He's drawn you to the truth. And he's given you, he's empowered you to obey the truth. Now, it doesn't mean we know everything, but the evidence of our obedience is it shows that we know him. And I want to touch on a couple of scriptures to back that up. First John chapter 2. <clears throat> First John chapter 2 starting in verse 3 
And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that says I know him and keeps not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Now there's a lot of people, myriads, innumerable multitude out there that claim that they know the Father but they're not keeping his commandments. They're using the writings of Paul to trump the words of the Creator. And we, there's n numerous scriptures that uh, discuss our relationship uh, to the commandments. They're overlooked. But if you can get through the first book, this first book of John here, if you can get through this book and claim that you don't need to keep the commandments, you're missing something. Now, some like to write it off. Well, there's only ten commandments. No, that's, that's not true. Uh, the last verse in the book of Leviticus says, These are the commandments that were given to the children of Israel. Um, also, let's go over here to John 14. And... I, I didn't write this down, but it just came to my mind. Also in 1 John, it says that you have no need that anyone teach you for the uh, anointing which you have teaches you all things. But uh, I didn't write that one down for the sake of time. I won't look it up. In John 14 and verse 26... <clears throat> But the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. And I think between that verse and that verse over there in 1 John, it really ties in closely with what we read in Jeremiah, that you won't have to teach every man. Why? Because the Spirit is drawing, doing the teaching, and putting his instructions in the hearts of his people. John 16 and verse 13. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. John, and it says that he will... Uh, Guide you into all truth. Look at John 17, 17. This is the Messiah praying to the Father and he says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So it is the word of the Father that we're supposed to be set apart. Sanctified is to be made holy, to be set apart. And the Spirit is going to lead us into that sanctification of His Word. Let's go to Ezekiel 36, also referring to this <coughs> new covenant. <coughs> Excuse me. Thirty-six, starting in verse 23. And I will sanctify my great name which was profaned amongst the heathen which you have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am Yahweh, saith my sovereign Yahweh, which I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. <clears throat> For I will take you from amongst the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. And I will sprinkle. And by the way, uh, he's doing the gathering now, but at his return, he will bring his people into the land. Um, in verse 25, Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. And back to that, that topic uh, real quick. All throughout the scriptures it says that the land is promised to the house of Israel. We have that hope. We know that the land was given. But that theology is totally overlooked in the mainstream. We've jumped from inheriting the land to being on clouds with harps and um, 
you know, having angels' wings and such. But there's a verse in Luke where a man is prophesying and he says that the Messiah will sit on the throne of David, his father, and rule the house of Israel forever. How does that fit into that theology? He's going to sit on the throne and rule Israel forever. That has to fit in there somewhere. Verse 26. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and will give you a heart of flesh. I will change your heart. That's the difference between the old and the new. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. He's going to put a spirit inside of his people, change their hearts, and cause them to obey. It's easy. <clears throat> Let's go to uh, Acts 17 real quick. Now, the reason I'm, I'm touching on this is we see in the New Covenant, He's bringing people to the knowledge of Him. They will be taught His ways and empowered to obey. But He's bringing people out of a state of ignorance. We're born in ignorance and He draws us to His truth. In verse 30, it says, In the times of ignorance, Elohim winked. At, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. In order to repent, what do you have? What do you have to have? Knowledge. You have to have knowledge of what you need to repent of. And that's why he gave us his instructions. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 4. I'm just going to touch on the sins of ignorance real quick. <clears throat> Leviticus 4, starting in verse 1. And Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a soul shall sin through ignorance against any of the commandments of Yahweh, concerning things which ought not to be done, and shall do any against any of them, if the priest that is anointed do sin, according to the sin of the people, then let him bring for his sin, which he hath sinned, a young bullock without blemish, unto Yahweh for a sin offering. Um, skip down to verse 13. And if the whole congregation of Israel sin through ignorance, and the thing be hid from the eyes of the assembly, and they have done somewhat against any of the commandments of Yahweh concerning things which should not be done and are guilty, when the sin which they have sinned against is known, then the congregation shall offer a young bullock for a sin, for the sin, and bring him before the tabernacle of the congregation. Now notice it says, when they sin and it becomes known, once they have knowledge, then uh, they will make an offering, pr uh, present the offering for what was done in ignorance. Uh, chapter 5 of Leviticus, starting in verse 15. If a soul commit a trespass and sin through ignorance in the holy things of Yahweh, then he shall bring for his trespass unto Yahweh a ram without blemish out of the flocks with thy estimation by shekels of silver after the shekel of the sanctuary for a trespass offering. And he shall make amends for the harm that he hath done in the holy thing and shall add the fifth part thereunto and give it unto the priest. And the priest shall make an atonement for him with the ram of the trespass offering and it shall be forgiven him. Now the reason I'm going over these things, how many people out there are either trying to serve to the best of their ability or just completely living their life uh, away from the faith and not even concerned. But how much of these people are living in sin because of ignorance? And is the Messiah's sacrifice good enough to cover that? And I'm not saying uh, I'm not the judge or anything, but think about it. Let's say a, a man is raised by his mama and daddy to live a certain way. But mama and daddy told him to stay away from them Bible people or stay away from the religious people. 
and they die in that state. But they honored their mother and father their whole life. Or what if a person was on a, a desert island and never had the knowledge of, of the truth, you know, and I'm putting a lot of what ifs into the snare, but there's a lot of people out there that are living to the best of their ability. Um, and here, you know, sometimes we're splitting hairs in the congregation about, you know, uh, different doctrines, different viewpoints, different, you know, I, I spend more time talking to uh, mainstream people, trying to pull them out of the mainstream than I do people that are lost. And maybe that's just, you know, what I, I run into. Um, but I, I, I've been, I don't know, I've been meditating on this a, a lot lately. Is the Messiah's sacrifice good enough to cover the sins of ignorance? And I believe there's a verse, which I'm going to read it here uh, in a few minutes. Actually, uh, I'll just go ahead and quote it. It says that Yahweh is not willing that any should perish. Right. And that all should come to the knowledge of the truth and be brought to repentance. Um, anyway, continue on. Let's look at Hosea chapter 4. Hosea chapter 4. And there's another, you know, there's another thing that is, is totally missed by the mainstream. Who's going to be in the kingdom during the millennium? Not everybody's going to enter into the millennium as spiritual bodies. If, if that's not the case, uh, I believe Isaiah talks about a time when a sinner will live to be a hundred years. And there's a group that are tested with the Feast of Tabernacles during the millennial reign. Why does there need to be a testing if everybody's spiritual and changed? Um, I believe that there's a mass of people that are going to enter into the millennium to be taught of his ways. Um, and then Satan shall be loosed uh, after the thousand years be finished. But the reason he's going to be bound for a thousand years is to give the ignorant knowledge. Now you won't, you, you won't hear that out there in the mainstream church. You're either going to heaven or you're going to burn. One of the two. Uh, now let's look at Hosea chapter 4 and I'm talking instead of turning <clears throat> and let's look at verse 6 my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge. Now notice, they're not just destroyed for, for a lack of knowledge. It's because they rejected knowledge. I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy Elohim. I will also forget thy children. Now, I don't believe that their punishment is him forgetting their children. I believe because they have rejected knowledge and his Torah, their children followed suit. And another place he talks about visiting the sins unto the children. Why? Because children learn from their parents. Hebrews chapter 2. Starting in verse um, 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. 
Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to Elohim, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered, being tempted, he is able to succor them that are being, being tempted. He became just like us to experience what we experience so that he can help us in the same situations. Chapter 4 and verse 15. Uh, chapter 4 verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that ha is passed into the heavens, Yeshua the son of Elohim, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. What our Messiah went through, he went through for us. He was tempted and was touched by the same feeling of our infirmities so that we could come boldly to the throne of grace and find help. Ask and thou shalt receive. Chapter 5 and verse 1. For every high priest takes from among men, taken from among men, is ordained for men in things pertaining to Elohim, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Who can have compassion on the ignorant? The priest can have passion on the ignorant, compassion on the ignorant, and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. He's talking about the priest. And by reason hereof he ought as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. So even the high priest had his own infirmities in verse 4. And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of Elohim, as was Aaron. So also Messiah glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but but he that saith unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. And he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So he's saying that Messiah was chosen just as the priesthood was chosen. Acts chapter 3. <clears throat> I'm just going to pull out a few verses here on people living in ignorance and we're going to see an awesome display of the Messiah begging for forgiveness for people that were living in ignorance and then we'll close out here in just a minute. Acts chapter 3 starting in verse 12 And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, You men of Israel, why marvel you at this? Or why look you so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? The Elohim of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the Elohim of our fathers, hath glorified his son Yeshua, whom you delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life, whom Elohim hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom you see and know, yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I know that through ignorance you did it. 
and did also your rulers. But those things which Elohim before had shown by the mouth of all his prophets, that Messiah should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of Yahweh, and he shall send Yeshua Messiah, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things. And that kind of ties in with what we were just talking about. The heavens is holding on to Yeshua until the time of the restitution of all things. When the Messiah returns. He's coming back to set things straight. He's coming back to establish a kingdom and to enlighten the eyes of the ignorant. And he's also coming back with wrath too because uh, Revelation talks about a people running and hiding in the rocks from the wrath of the Lamb. But what I want to point out here is, is uh, uh, Peter is speaking to a group of people that turned over the Holy One and wanted him to be killed. And when Pilate tried to release him, they said, no, 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 no. Uh, we'll take Barabbas. And he says, I know that you did it through ignorance. He's offering these people a little grace. The same people that turned over his Savior for death, he's offering them a little grace. He's explaining to them what's going on. And, and he's saying, just repent so that you can be forgiven. Come to the knowledge of the truth and repent. Let's go over here to 1 Timothy. First Timothy chapter 1 starting in verse 12. And I thank Messiah Yeshua our master who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful putting me into the ministry. Now notice Paul knew where his strength came from. It says that he enabled me. Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and unbelief. Paul was out there putting the death sentence on followers of Yeshua, but he obtained mercy because he did it in ignorance. And what, we're, what I'm trying to bring together here is how can we bash and try to cram. I'm not pointing no fingers or accusing anybody here, but I've been guilty before. Sometimes we get so zealous for the truth, we want to cram the truth down somebody's throat. But all that does is hardens the heart. We have to give a little grace. These people, and Paul himself, that were, you know, in, in Acts, we see he's talking to the people that turned over the prince of life for the death sentence, and he gave them a little grace. How much more people that see things just a little differently, people that pronounce things a little differently, or people that just see things in a different way, if they are trying to serve him with all their heart, how about a little grace? Now, that doesn't mean we have to forsake the truth for the sake of, of getting along. We, we have to stand up for what we believe in, but we still got to love them, especially those who are in the household of the faith. Um, I see, ooh, man, if you ever get on the Internet and see some of these forums and these people that are trying to discuss biblical things, people that stand for the same Messiah want to cut each other's throats over a, a, small, a small issue. Now, uh, Paul specifically tells us what we need to divide over. That's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. The immoral brother... He says, I don't, I'm not asking you to forsake the fornicators and the drunkards of this world. If you've got a brother that's living like that, that's who, who you need to disfellowship with over moral issues, not over the small hair-splitting things that we see so often. So here we see Paul receiving a little mercy because 
he was zealously persecuting the church, but he was doing it in ignorance. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. Starting in verse 17. This I say therefore and testify in the master that you henceforth walk, uh, walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of Elohim through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of of their heart, who being fat, past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Uh, we have to be wary about uh, the state of ignorance that we're in because we can get to a point where our understanding is dark and we're alienated from the life of Elohim and we have a blind heart. Now uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 says that if the gospel be hidden it is because the Elohim, Satan of this world has blinded their hearts. Um, I'm going to close out with two more scriptures. Luke chapter 23 this is one of the most amazing displays of love and forgiveness. Unspeakable, beyond, beyond human comprehension of forgiveness and love. Luke 23, starting in verse, wait a minute, one second. Starting in verse uh, 34. Then said Yeshua, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The Savior of the world, the Son of the Creator, has been handed over into the hands of sinners being tortured, being brutally treated, spit upon, beaten, and hung on a stake. And he says, Father, forgive them. They're doing this in ignorance. Let's go to Luke chapter 12 and we'll close out here. Verse 45, 12:45. But and if that servant say in his heart, My master delays his coming, and shall begin to beat the men servants and the maidens, and to eat and drink and to be drunken, the master of that servant will come in a day when he looks not for him. And at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in sunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant which knew his master's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes, shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much of him, they will ask the more. We have been drawn to the truth. We have been blessed with an abundance of understanding that uh, many have not seen yet. Let us be thankful of this knowledge. Let us be thankful, thankful that we've been brought out of a life of ignorance. And let us walk with integrity with the knowledge we've been getting. Hallelujah.